Have you reviewed Tomb Raider 3? Great review, do the third one please. Do Tomb Raider 3 please. That TR3 review ain't too far away. And I hope to see Tomb Raider 3 soon. I like the idea but still waiting for that Tomb Raider 3 review. Currently playing the third game in anticipation of your review of it. How's your Tomb Raider 3 review coming along? When is the Tomb Raider 3 review coming out? Finish the long abandoned Tomb Raider reviews? I'd really love to see that Tomb Raider 3 review he's gonna do. Hope to one day see your TR3 video. You should review the rest of the classic TR games too. Hey, G from, can you review Tomb Raider 3, 4 and Will 5? Will we get 2 and 3 as Please well? Please do one for Tomb Raider I 3. I hope you continue to do TR 3 and 4 awesome as well. Awesome video, I can't wait for TR 3 or TR 2 Gold. Are you by the way almost done with TR 3? Can't wait for your TR 3 review. Where's the Tomb Raider 3 review? Please make the Tomb Raider 3 review. Voila, mach Teil 3! Review Tomb Raider 3! Review it already! Review it already! Review it already! G from the gamer, the legend, he's come to show you the way. But one thing I need to ask, where the fuck the two made a free review? All right, all right, all right. I've been getting this question for 11 years now. It's time to deliver. The wait is finally over. Honest Gods Productions. Let's go back to the late 90s. Tomb Raider 1 and 2 were the most amazing games I had ever played. Playing as a badass British lady on adventures across the globe with elements of the supernatural was unlike anything I had played so far. My dad had a PlayStation, but he lived in Sweden, whereas I had moved to Germany with my mom, so I only got to play it a few times a year. That would change in 1999. I knew I would get a PlayStation for Christmas, but that was still many months away. Tomb Raider 3 Adventures of Lara Croft was released in November of 98 and I really wanted that game, but it cost 100 Deutsche Mark, which is about 50 euros today. I got 2.5 Deutsche Mark for my allowance every week, so I had to save up for almost a year. As soon as I gathered enough cash, I bought the game, even though I didn't have my PlayStation yet. Just looking at the game and the booklet felt so exciting. I don't remember if I got it before or after I got the game, but before I could play it we already had the strategy guide. I would suck up all the information I could out of this book and you can tell by the look of it. Remember, we didn't have the internet or even a computer at my family's place back then, so this was very special to me. The wait became unbearable, so I begged my mom for weeks to give me the PlayStation before Christmas. One day in November, a friend of mine celebrated his birthday we saw Disney's Tarzan at the cinema. I still remember it clear as day. I came home, walked into the living room, and there it was. The PlayStation was hooked up to the TV and finally I could play Tomb Raider 3. I don't think I'll ever recapture that feeling. The game was even better than I imagined and I considered it my favorite game of all time for many years. 24 years have passed since its release. So, does it hold up as well as its two predecessors? Where does it stand in my personal Tomb Raider ranking? You'll get the answers. I'm so looking forward to playing this game again. From the gamer who lanchant he's come to show you the way in this world of games. G from reviews. Once again, we have the option to visit Lara's home before we begin our adventure. Just like in the first game, we start in her bedroom. You know the first thing I did when I played this for the first time? I ran into the fire and my mom was shocked. I left. There's plenty of stuff to do here. The training area from the first game is back. In the second game this room was just empty. Here we learn old and new moves. Yes, since a little run-in with Marco the dragon Bartoli, Lara learned how to crouch and crawl. How progressive. It's a little clumsy since you can only drop down backwards. In addition to climbing ladders she can now hang on monkey bars. Last but not least she can finally sprint. Me likey. The pool looks a little different and pushing this button opens a door in the main hall. Push another button to open a timed door across the room. If you make it in time you'll enter Lara's treasure room. This is so cool. We have the Skion from the first game, the dagger from Tomb Raider 2 and even an item we'll see in future games. Oh and if you didn't notice, a freaking T-Rex head mounted over the fireplace. Jesus Christ Lara, what the hell? How did you even... 
Whatever. In the dining room you can listen to music and dance on tables. Winston, our trusty old farting butler, tags along as usual. Can we lock him in the freezer again? Yes we can. Should we lock him in the freezer? Absolutely. Don't try to break out again Winston or you'll see my vengeance. Outside the assault course is back with slight changes. Best of all we find our dual pistols here and there's even a shooting range. But wait, could it be? Winston! I warned you old man, I've had enough of your stalking. I can't kill you, but I will lock you in a thousand times if I have to. You would think that's it. In school a friend of mine told me about a book you can pull in the library. Yeah, right. I didn't believe him. But sure enough, if you look closely you can see that one book stands out. Pull it and the fireplace goes out. Holy spooky crap. Climb up the wall, push a few blocks and open another door. Time is tight, so hurry up. In Tomb Raider 2, this door leads to a bunch of golden treasure. Apparently, she used that gold to buy a giant freaking aquarium. Can we swim with the fishes? Of course we can. We can even find a key underwater. This key opens a gate to the labyrinth, which now is a goddamn quad bike racetrack. She must be bored out of her mind when she isn't on adventures. So hop on that quad bike and race for the best time. Man, this training level has it all. The second game was already a huge improvement over the first, but this adds even more fun stuff. For me it is the best tutorial level I have ever played and I stand by that statement. It's fun to explore and find these secret areas. Now I'm definitely ready for a trip around the globe. The opening cutscene shows a meteorite crashing into Antarctica millions of years ago. Fragments scattered all over the world. In the present day we see some dudes with shovels and bulldozers looking for the meteorite. A guy named Willard seems to be in charge. They discover huge stone heads like on the Easter Islands and a wooden cross. What does this have to do with anything? You'll see. One thing I'll have to say right off the bat is that I love the loading screens. They are the best in the entire series in my eyes. Jungle is the first level which takes place in India. It starts rather unusually with a long slope. But don't slide down yet or you'll miss the first secret. Yes, the secrets are back. Unlike Tomb Raider 2 and its 3 dragons per level, this game has different amounts of secrets per stage and they are regular items this time. This stage has 6 of them. You're not getting anything extra for finding every secret in a level, but finding all secrets in the entire game gives you a special reward at the end. So keep your eyes open. The first secret is the shotgun. Nice. It looks different than in the previous entries. The medipacks have green crosses instead of red. Did the red cross sue them or something? The first enemy in the game is actually a friend. The little monkeys don't hurt us unless we shoot first. So I'll just let you be, my hairy fellow. The first boulder is easy to avoid. Whereas you could save anywhere at any time in the second game, here the save crystals make a return. Unlike in the first game where you could only save at these crystals, here you collect them and can save later. So as long as you have save crystals in your inventory, you can save. You could say it's a hybrid between the first two games. I think this system is fine because I always have more crystals than I need, but this mechanic could be frustrating for many players. Not sure why they even changed it. This only counts for the PlayStation version. On the PC the crystals are green instead of blue and replenish your health when you pick them up. Most players probably got impaled by the spikes on their first try here. The ending is very near but we can't get there because of quicksand. There's a midi pack. Hey, that's mine! Come back here, you little rascal! Oh, he led me to a switch. What a nice little chap. Remember how the first level in Tomb Raider 2 had a trap marathon? This stage has traps too, but they aren't nearly as stressful. After riding a zipline we encounter our first tiger. The monkeys are so helpful. Some lead you to items and others show you where to go. Just crawling along with my monkey buddy. As we get deeper into the jungle we walk past two boulder traps. Watch out for a third boulder behind the leaves. We have to flood this entire area by pulling a few switches in a room with lit torches. Now we can climb up the rocks. I have the German version so the blood is purple. Except when they die in water. I guess the sensors missed that. Here you have to be quick to pick up the key. If the monkey picks it up it will never let go of it and you have to kill the poor guy. And you don't want to kill an innocent little monkey. 
Do you? With this key we open a door and get a cutscene. Lara meets a guy named Tony and asks him about the artifact she's looking for. He doesn't say anything useful except that his companions Randy and Rory are inside a temple. I'm usually not a fan of German dubbing, but in German this guy is so over the top and it's infinitely better that way. <laughs> Hearing the English version feels so lame. <laughs> yeah. Along with the Great Wall, Jungle is my favorite first level in the series. It is huge and feels a lot more open than most levels we've seen so far. The exotic location is a great display of the improvements in the lighting department and we even get weather effects for the first time. This along with caves is probably the Tomb Raider level I've played the most and it never gets boring. My dad doesn't like this stage but for me it's one of the greatest. In Temple Ruins we encounter venomous cobras. When they bite us we get poisoned and our energy slowly depletes. Thankfully medipacks instantly cure us. Hello my monkey friends! Hey what the hell dudes! I thought we were homies! Maybe the monkeys in this level are from a different gang. You see those piranhas in the water? They can't be killed but they will eat us alive in seconds. Avoid them at all costs. After some fun platforming sections we enter the temple. Man this game is even darker than Tomb Raider 2. Check out this six armed statue. Creepy. In the next room is another one. Oh my god. God. As a kid this huge thing freaked me out. The problem is that we can't shoot it from a distance because it will use its swords as shields. I prefer a more aggressive approach anyway. Killing it turns it back into stone. We have to collect two keys to open this huge gate. It doesn't matter in which order we get them. I usually get the secret first that involves poisoned arrows and a boulder trap. Then I take the left path. Here we have to fill an empty pool with water. We swim into a tall room. Watch out for the poison darts and the collapsing ceiling. This is one of the most memorable rooms for me. We have to make our way up and perform one badass kill. Crawl past the slicing blades. One boring part is this section where we have to push blocks to get to a hidden lever. God damn it man, this is the third game and we're still pushing blocks? I'll never stop complaining about this. I don't care, push a block over my grave. In case you let the two monkeys live near the empty pool, they might drown once you fill it with water. That's terrible! Get the key and move on. The right path has us traversed through quicksand. Keep moving and we will emerge before we drown. We can make it past the slicing blades and spiked wall without taking damage, but our timing has to be perfect. In another room with a pool we have to pull some switches in order to activate fire breathing statues. Now we reveal invisible platforms? Don't worry about the statue, it won't wake up. Pick up the second key while avoiding another spiked wall. Now the entire area is filled with quicksand. The ceiling starts to collapse so stay on the far right. Here we have two options. Left we have to avoid blades and run away from a boulder. Right a monkey is out to get us. Hmm hard choice. With the two keys we can now open the gate and have to avoid spikes coming down from the ceiling while climbing up a ladder. Talk about stress. Kill two more statues and pick up two of their scimitars. No, we can't use them as weapons. That would have been rad. Place them in the empty hands of a third statue to open a door. As we enter the final room we see two floating dead bodies. Too bad Randy and Rory didn't make it. We have to pick up three more keys. First kill the final statue. For the second key we have to pull two levers as a spiked ceiling starts to descend. This part is tough and even the tiniest mistake can be fatal. The final key has us pull two levers under water while current is pulling us toward a spike wall. Insert the three keys and leave this cursed temple. In a cutscene Tony floats on a raft. Lara for some reason starts to shoot at him. He just laughs and suddenly an earthquake causes the temple to crumble. Lara nearly gets crushed but survives and sees a quad bike. Man, what a level. This is the definition of an extraordinary Tomb Raider experience. The temple is huge and packed with traps and memorable set pieces. From an atmospheric standpoint it does everything right for me. For a second level it's pretty damn difficult but very rewarding. This might surprise a lot of people but Temple Ruins is my number one level of the entire series. This makes it one of the best stages I have played in any game. It's that good.
The river Ganges starts with a long and boring platforming section to get to a secret. If we at any point in this level fall into the river, we either die by drowning or getting devoured by piranhas. Once we get that out of the way, we can get on the quad bike. This vehicle controls a lot better than the snowmobile in Tomb Raider 2. It's quite fun, at first. This level has two main routes and we have to make a choice. The left path is rather boring and the flaws of the quad bike become more apparent. Jumping over gaps or driving near edges makes me nervous and I fell to my death multiple times on this playthrough. The right path is more fun but we'll miss a secret if we go there. So what's the point? Tell me! I'll show it to you anyway. Here we have to find two keys to open a gate. From a visual standpoint alone this is more interesting. Climbing on trees, just like a monkey. Speaking of monkeys, they are going ape shit. This is a fucking massacre. With the gate open we can jump over the quicksand with the quad bike and here the two paths converge. Near the waterfall a couple of vultures attack us. Oh look, Tony's raft. As we enter the cave behind the waterfall, the level ends. This stage can be fun depending on the path you take. I would prefer if you could take both paths, but you're not supposed to do that. As someone who wants all secrets, I'm disappointed that the mandatory path is such a drag. Other than that, I enjoy most of my time here and as long as precision isn't a factor, I like the quad bike too. Caves of Kalia is a freaking labyrinth. I'm serious. It's a legit maze with multiple floors, boulder traps, movable blocks and cobras. It's a very, very short stage, but it's frustrating to get lost as most areas look the same. I used to know the shortest path by heart, but I don't remember anymore and I don't want to look it up. After about 6 minutes, I found the right way and dropped into a cobra pit. 10 fucking cobras are ready to fill our blood with poison as we run away from another boulder. Thankfully the cobras don't move so we're safe in the center. And here he is. Tony uses the artifact to throw fireballs at us. Don't jump into the water as it will turn into lava or whatever that's supposed to be. With the shotgun he dies quickly. Picking up the Infada stone ends the level but first we need to pick up some items including the grenade launcher. Hell yeah. This level is a mixed bag. I like the atmosphere and the cobra room, but the maze part stretches too long. The boss fight is alright. So overall I feel the first half of India is outstanding and the second half is above average. In a CGI cutscene, Lara meets Dr. Willard. He informs her that there are three more artifacts and gives her a little history lesson. Five men from Charles Darwin's expedition to the HMS Beagle are looking for food on an island in 1834. They follow animal tracks into an ice cavern where they find four artifacts but get attacked by wolves. One of them dies and the ice bridge collapses. So now we know the story behind the wooden cross Willard found in the opening. The artifacts are now in different parts of the world and Lara agrees to find them for him. Do you like this video so far? Please leave a like and subscribe to my channel for more retro gaming goodness. You would expect to get to the next level now, but here is where this game differs from its predecessors. We can actually choose which chapter we want to play next. South Pacific, London or Nevada. That is so awesome and I remember taking a look at each level first before I decided which one I wanted to start with. From a strategic standpoint, it's smart to start with Nevada, but you wouldn't know that at first. I'll tell you why soon. Let's travel to the United States. Nevada Desert has a skill more vultures. By the way, I really love her new clothes. It's my favorite outfit of the entire series. But enough about fashion. Instead of cobras, we face poisonous rattlesnakes, which can be very hard to see behind bushes. Whoa, what was that? Jump into the hole and swim to the next area. Here we have a canyon. If you fall into the water, there's no way to get up again and you have to restart the level. At least that's what I thought as a kid. I just couldn't figure it out. It turns out you have to do a running jump without holding onto the edge. Why? This knowledge could have saved me a lot of trouble back then. Huh, more jets. What's going on here? Whoa, that was close. We have to find a detonator switch to blow this place up. Now we're in a cave above the waterfalls. Don't fall into the water or you'll have to climb up all over again. One of the secrets gives us dual Uzis. Now that's what I'm talking about. Near the water wheel a dude wants to punch us to death. So it's just fair for me to put bullets in his head, right? Fun fact, this guy has a sprite from Doom on his back. 
As we walk along the sluice way, we get to this area which I've always liked. The water looks so much better than in the older games. It's easy to miss this one switch. Now that we have activated the water wheel and raised the elevator, we can return. Did you say something? In the elevator we pick up the detonator switch and make our way back. Look at that pattern on the wall. I've always thought it looked like a face with a mustache. Blow up the TNT box and progress. What is this place? Don't touch the fence or we'll get electrocuted. Could you possibly fly any lower? This section has a running back and forth a lot and it gets tedious. Essentially we have to fill a water tank so we can jump over the fence. Might as well use my grenades to blow up these dudes. The grenade launcher works a little differently than in Tomb Raider 2. Grenades don't explode immediately unless they hit a target. Oh, what have we here? Another quad bike. We use this vehicle to drive up onto the roof to get a generator access card. This guy is trapped in there. I'll help you out. Ungrateful prick. Now we can turn off the electricity and use the quad bike to jump over another fence. A cutscene shows Lara crashing the quad bike, leaving her unconscious. Two military police officers pick her up. Nevada Desert is such a fun level. Sure, we're in the desert again, but it doesn't look like the Egypt stages from Tomb Raider 1 at all. The part with the water wheel sticks out to me and I have a good feeling here. I like that we get to drive the quad bike again and there aren't any frustrating jumps. High security compound starts off in a cell. We only have one medipack and our save crystals. That's it. So this is the third game in a row with a weaponless level. Everything we've collected so far is gone forever. And that's why we picked Nevada first, kids. By walking through the green motion sensor, the door opens and a military policeman comes rushing in trying to beat us up. So what do we do? Open all the other cells so that a bunch of criminals can murder him. <laughs> You know I love you, Lara, but what's your problem? You don't know what these people did, and I'm just going to assume the policemen are the good guys here. So Lara is basically a terrorist. Of course, as a kid, I didn't give this much thought at all. Whatever. It's fun to watch the prisoners do their thing. The AI isn't the brightest. Back then I used a weapon cheat and found out that you can't kill the first prisoner, not even with a rocket launcher. Superman, is this you? Now we have to break out somehow. By pushing a few blocks we can at least make our way out of this cell block. It's too damn dark here to see the barbed wire. That first policeman wasn't armed, but now we have to get by one with a gun undetected. I messed up, but thankfully my gangster friends took care of him. One of them didn't make it. Rest in peace, brother. Behind the lavatory in the storage room we have to move some boring blocks in order to get through a hole in the roof. A switch floods both the lavatory and the storage room. Ah, Laura, this water must be fucking dirty! Let's disable the lit stuff with a switch and drop down. I have to let this guard out. I feel bad about this, but I have to lure him into a trap. A bunch of dudes. Sure enough, they punch him to death. Very efficient. Another switch opens the ventilation ducts and finally we can leave the first area. These dudes are really helpful, they even open doors for me. On a couple more occasions we have to release more prisoners to get rid of guards. I actually like trying to sneak past them undetected. We haven't really seen stealth in this series before. Going through the sensors activates a turret so it's not recommended. I love this setting and the lighting, very pleasing to the eyes. Oh look, one of the jets we saw in Nevada desert. Here we have to activate a laser beam at the right moment to fry the guard. Brutal. This huge satellite can be moved by the push of a button. So cool. Under it is a pool with a strong current and deadly fans. The following part is quite complicated and involves a lot of running around. When we finally make it we get access to a room with our dual pistols and a goddamn desert eagle. Of course we get a desert eagle in the desert, what did you expect? This is pretty much the best weapon in the game, but I'll save it for later. Oh, and one of the secrets gives us the grenade launcher back. Finally, we're not dependent on criminals. Now we get to be the criminals. Lara kills more and more policemen and even police dogs. Jesus. This is the first time we have to monkey swing. Kill more innocent people, walk into the back of a truck and watch a cutscene. Lara hides in the truck as some dudes close the doors. She drinks some coke or whatever and that's it. 
This is one long ass level, but it's another one of my favorites. As far as stages without weapons go, this is by far the most creative and rewarding. Sure, the action is questionable at best, but the setting is amazing and you don't get your weapons back within the first few minutes like an offshore rig. You actually have to use some strategy from time to time and it's not as cryptic and boring as Natal's Mines. In that regard, we have a clear winner. It's the weakest of the Nevada levels in my eyes, but that just shows how good this chapter is. Believe it or not, we're actually in Area 51 now. I wonder what we'll discover here. Kill the guard before he gets to the handprint scanner. This is the only way we get into the room with the MP5 submachine gun. Now we're talking. This feels like a James Bond movie, avoiding laser traps and stuff. In this level we can set free more prisoners, but it's totally optional. Some more rooms and even a secret can only be reached if you kill the guards before they get to the scanners. We get to a room with missiles. Of course I ran into the sensor and activated the turret. Idiot. Another example of me being an idiot is dying by falling and finding out that I didn't save so I had to repeat almost 20 minutes of gameplay. That's the worst, but it happens all the time. Skipping ahead, we get into a room with an electric train track. Needless to say, don't climb up there. In this room we get our shotgun back. This is some intense stuff. Monkey swing above the electricity while avoiding the laser trap. Just a normal day for a croft. Check this out. Is that a saucer? We can't get there yet. After a part with the timed doors, we get to a room with 5 switches. We get zero clues about which ones to pull. You see the room with the saucer after pulling a correct switch. That happens with 3 of them. So by pulling those 3, you open the door. Not very intuitive. We can't really do anything with the UFO yet, but we have to get on its roof to collect a launch code pass. Who on earth put it there? Or someplace other than Earth. Now we have to make it all the way back to the huge missile. Put in the card, push the button and run for your life. Such an awesome moment. We can now climb up inside the missile silo. That is if you don't backflip to your own death for no reason. After getting past more laser traps, we're outside. Time to test the MP5. It's the weapon of choice for long distance kills, similar to the M16. With the code clearance disc, we return to the saucer. Insert the disc and... Oh my god! You're seeing what I'm seeing, right? As a huge X-Files fan, I approve of this with all my heart. There is another alien and... Orcas? What are they doing here? For one of the secrets we actually get into the orca tank and get to swim with these beautiful animals. I have a huge aquarium in my giant mansion, wanna come? If she can transport a giant T-Rex head, she sure as hell can bring two killer whales home. Let's take a look inside the saucer. I must have stepped into some kind of portal. Look how tiny the UFO is and how large it is from inside. It hurts my sense of physics. Sadly we don't get to fight aliens or a boss. Just kill more military people and pick up element 115. This ends the Nevada chapter. Area 51 is such an incredible level. It's very unique and hasn't really got anything to do with tombs, but this works just as well. I love that they actually show the aliens and discovering the UFO blew my mind as a kid. Overall, I can say that Nevada is my favorite chapter of the original trilogy. It's only three levels, but they all have their unique moments. This stage and its setting make it a personal highlight of this chapter. South Pacific or London? Which one should I play next? It really doesn't matter that much. I usually play South Pacific next so that I'll have more ammo for a certain type of weapon for one specific London level. If you've played this game before, you know what I'm talking about. Coastal Village has the most breathtaking opening of them all. I mean, damn, this looks gorgeous. And I don't even mean Lara's new outfit. Starting in a tropical lagoon, we have to swim to the shore. Here we once again have two different routes we can take. In the water we find the smuggler's key which opens a door nearby. I recommend taking this path. You'll miss one of the secrets if you skip it. It's definitely the more difficult way filled with traps and crocodiles. What am I shooting at? In the water we find the harpoon gun. This was the most useless weapon in Tomb Raider 2 and it's just as shitty here. Man, it's dark here. Essentially, this cavern is one long platforming section with some shooting in between. As a kid, I thought it was too scary, so I never went here. Hey, someone or something is shooting poison darts at me. The strategy guide calls them cannibals. Wow, that's messed up. I really dig these effects. Let's enter the temple. 
Thanks for the warning. Don't go into the light or you'll raise spikes. With the press of a button we can cover the skylight. We can either progress here or make our way to that area we skipped in the beginning. As someone who wants all secrets, I picked the ladder. Here we kill more tribesmen and have to search for three serpent stones. They're quite easy to find except for one which has this messed up jump that freaks me out. By the way, to the best of my knowledge, there's no way to get down there alive. Believe me, I've tried. Placing the stones inside the snake heads opens the gate to the village. It's safe to say, this is not a place where you want to stay longer than necessary, as it's crawling with the dudes who want to eat you. Here we can see the way to the next level, but we can't get there yet. I know that a guy will come up from behind when I turn this wheel, but I jump up out of my seat every time anyway. It's just so rude to sneak up on someone like that, man. Have some manners. I like this part where we traverse across the rooftops of the huts. Here's the part I usually mess up. Jump over the flames and get past a double blade trap. Who thinks it is stuff? I gotta say, the croco fans look infinitely better than in the first game. They actually look like one and not like Haribo gummy crocs. As we jump into a treehouse, we get a cutscene. Lara talks to a guy missing a leg. His plane crashed and some of his men disappeared. He's not sure if a tribesman was responsible for his leg. Hmm. At least he gives us a map. Wait a minute. Four out of three secrets? I don't know if this is a mistake or I'm just that great at this game. Coastal Village is another fun level with maybe a little too much trial and error. I love the exotic location and cannibalism gives it a dark twist. In contrast to the River Ganges, this level handles the two paths much better as we have the option to see both. Crash site starts in the treehouse. Bye bye my dude, I hope you make it somehow. Going back to the village causes an earthquake, so that's out of the question. With the help of the map, we journey across the swamp. This is one of the levels I've played the most over the years, so I know the way by heart. Why did I play it so often? Let me reintroduce Velociraptors. They too look much better than before. And take more bullets to kill. Shit. So yeah, this is pretty much the Lost Valley 2.0, new and improved. But first things first. Before we get to the main areas, we can visit this cave. It's pretty hidden and getting there takes a while. We pull a bunch of switches and monkey swing back and forth. Lots of unfair deaths here. To be quite honest, I despise this boring ass section. I wasted about 15 minutes here and what's my reward? Uzi clips. That's it? All that trouble for one set of Uzi clips? Not even a secret or a weapon? Wow, talk about pointless. Here is the crashed plane. We hear shots and sure enough there are some soldiers shooting raptors. The soldiers are friendly unless we shoot first. I'll just stay up here and watch the show. Who will survive? Only time will tell and I brought popcorn. Thanks for your help, guys. There are three areas we can go to. Let's start with the shortest one. There's a dead raptor and a dead soldier on the floor. What happened here? Oh my god, it's those little bastards from the lost world that bit the Swedish actor to death. As a Swede, it's my duty to avenge him. There are only a few pickups here, so on to the next area. Another guy gets attacked by raptors. This time I'll lend a hand. What's up, bro? Down here is another dead raptor and more of those tiny suckers. We pick up a key for the airplane and hear heavy steps. Could it be? Aw oh, yeah, another fucking T-Rex. And this one looks much more frightening than in the first two games. Have you ever seen Jurassic Park? What a dumb question. I know you have. Just stand still and the T-Rex won't see you. Suspicion is based on movement. Brilliant. You can even throw flares to distract it Ian Malcolm style. Love that. We have to pull switches on the opposite sides of the room without getting eaten. You can choose to fight the T-Rex, but I usually don't. At one point a raptor appears. But what happened to the T-Rex? Oh my god, it's dead. When did that happen and how? Let me rewind. Okay, so we hear it die, but I didn't do it, I swear. This has never happened to me. I googled for two minutes and didn't find anything, so maybe this was a glitch. Or it died of old age. 65 million years of old age. In the third area, we have to find another key. Let's see who wins this fight. God damn it, man. There's a switch in the water, but the piranhas stop us from pulling it. We have to climb up the tree. Ah, slippery son of a bitch! How did the raptor get up here? At the top we can see a dead raptor hanging from a rope. Watch this. 
pretty smart, eh? They don't give a shit about me. Surprisingly, the T-Rex fight isn't the scariest part of the level. Welcome to the Raptor House. Look at that bastard waiting for us. This room is pitch black and there are three switches to pull. The door closes behind us once we enter. Thankfully, there's a block we can stand on to keep safe. Pulling switches off course triggers more raptors. To be honest, this freaks me out even more than the mutants in TR1. Eventually, a trap door opens and we can climb up. There's the key. Do I even want to pick it up? Sure enough, another raptor comes running at us. Run away. With two keys, we can get into the plane where another dinosaur waits for us. Check out this mounted rocket launcher. Pull the switch and the ramp extends. Now for the grand finale. A seemingly endless amount of raptors appears and we can blow them all up with the rocket launcher. Kick ass. Shoot the walls to open the exit and leave the level. Another cutscene shows Lara meeting a tribesman who gives us a little backstory about an artifact. After Temple Ruins, this is my second favorite level of the game. Except for that one useless part, it's just highlight after highlight. The Lost Valley was great and might be the quintessential Tomb Raider level, but Crash Site gives us more dinosaurs, beautiful locations and infinitely creepy moments. It's among the best this series has to offer and for me it's the ultimate Jurassic Park video game experience. Madubu Gorge has poison breathing lizards. Splendid! This level is pretty damn complicated and offers multiple paths and shortcuts. Of course if you're going for the secrets you can't take the very first shortcut which skips a huge chunk of the stage. Do not under any circumstances fall into the river, it's instant death. The first half is excellent with cool set pieces like a cave behind a waterfall, fire traps and challenging platforming. I just wish these lizards wouldn't show up in tight spaces. Being poisoned is a tad inconvenient. The crocodiles are back. Oh look, another vehicle. This time it's a kayak. And let me tell you, if you had problems with the quad bike or the snowmobile, you have no idea what you're up to. I have played this game for over 20 years and it's my honest opinion that this thing is utterly terrible to control. It feels like a constant struggle that's impossible to master. Maybe that was intentional as I'm sure this would be a nightmare in real life. If so, it's a case of being too realistic. Turning is sluggish and if you're stuck on a corner, be prepared for a massive headache. It doesn't help that you're surrounded by traps. I guess my biggest problem is that it's just so Damn, slow. We're moving at a snail's pace here. Going up river? Seriously? Jesus Christ. Long live artificial intelligence. We leave the kayak behind for now and find a new weapon. This is the rocket launcher. Kick fucking ass. With this huge thing on our back, we monkey swing past fire breathing stone faces. After more climbing and platforming, it's time to relive our favorite Indiana Jones moments. Boulders, boulders and more boulders. Sometimes with fire. Let's pull the plug on this. I'm serious, we just pulled the plug, leaving behind a huge hole. Back in the kayak, we paddle back there and have to get into that hole. This is one of the worst parts in Tomb Raider history. Make sure to have full energy. This fall can take your entire life bar. I'm sure there's a trick to this, but I sure as hell haven't figured it out. Sometimes I barely survive, sometimes I die. After that crap, we have to pull a switch in a pool full of crocodiles. You can barely see them. Yeah, I don't know about this one. Madubu Gorge could have been one of the best levels, I think. It's a prime example of a gimmick ruining a great experience. It's visually stunning and provides a good challenge even for the experienced raiders. Unfortunately, the kayak sucks the fun out of it and leaves a bitter taste in my mouth. Temple of Puna has us murder more natives. I'm beginning to think Lara is a lunatic with selfish motifs. Here we have a room with a bunch of rolling blades and four buttons. Just make sure to stand here and you'll be fine. Or else this happens. Next is another room with a spiked ceiling and switches. Just pull out this block. Very kind of the trap maker to put it there. Finally, some giant ass boulders. Why do I get Crash Bandicoot flashbacks all of a sudden? We slide down a slope. Look, there's the artifact in the throne. Hello, you must be Puna then. This boss fight can be a little frustrating because his lightning bolts are actually one-hit kills. 
who can only harm him when he's shooting them. So I either use the pistols and fire constantly or take out the desert eagle to deal with him quicker. Every once in a while he shoots green lightning bolts which summon a poison lizard. Thankfully he doesn't shoot us as long as this little sucker is alive. Watch out for the edges and don't fall into the pit. Kinda reminds me of the giant mutant fight in Tomb Raider 1 now that I think of it. Side flipping is key here and before you know it he fucking explodes. Pick up the aura dagger and finish the South Pacific chapter. Temple of Puna is a very short level but I love it. It's a temple and that's what this series does best. I even enjoy the boss fight. With the exception of the kayak in Madabu Gorge, the South Pacific levels are just as fantastic as Nevada and the first two India stages. Can the rest of the game hold up to this standard? Let's find out as we travel to London. Thames Wharf, holy crap, a cat suit? Uh, what was I saying? Thames Wharf is a level I'm not overly familiar with. How is that you may ask? As a kid I found a shortcut where you can beat the level in a minute. I'm not kidding. Of course it's well known today, but I was proud to have found it by myself. In general, I can say that I don't know the London levels as well as the stages we've already discussed. But here we go. It's fitting we have to shoot crows, rats and blokes. Man is it dark. Oh, I didn't even see that. Got to remember to use the flares more often. This entire first section annoys me. It's too much running back and forth, climbing up and down and falling to my death for my taste. I must have spent an hour here. It gets more interesting when we get to the second half. But first kill some guards. It's what Lara does. Breaking, entering and murdering. There are three water tanks. Some are filled, others not. You can probably guess what we have to do here. Pump water from one tank to the next and then back again and so forth. It's kind of a brain teaser with deadly propellers and I like it. The most memorable part for me involves a block. Yes, you heard me correctly. I finally had something nice to say about a block. This is yellow killer robot that can only turn left. With the block we have to lure it to an electrical panel. This opens a trap door. Bye bye you yellow devil, you served me well. Oh no, an alarm. Alarm! Alarm! Well, at least it's not as annoying as an offshore rig. I like the blue tones of this flooded area. Now all that's left is to get to the top of the cathedral roof and kill more mercenaries. Just watch out for the barbed wire. Oddly enough one of the secrets is not ammunition or health but a cathedral key. It disappears from our inventory after this level and we don't get to use it. Feels really out of place. A cutscene shows Lara holding a sniper at gunpoint. He tells her about his contractor, Miss Sophia Lee. His father and grandfather worked for her too, but she's only in her late 20s or early 30s. That can't be right, can it? It ends with him being stupid. One of the main reasons I used the shortcut most of the time is that Tam's Wharf is a rather boring level that is too damn dark. I don't find it interesting, especially the beginning. I do enjoy the second half more, but this is a huge step down from what we've seen so far, in my opinion. Old Witch drops us into dirty water. Yuck. This can't be healthy. In case you didn't know, Old Witch is the name of an abandoned tube station in London, also known as an underground train station. So this should be a great setting for a level. I just hope that in real life there aren't as many green guys down there. I'm serious, look at this dude. He has green skin. What's up with that? And what about these dogs? Are they possessed or something? There are so many objectives in this level and it would take forever to discuss them all. Basically two escalators lead to separate tube tracks. This is a huge level and finding out where you have to go and what you have to do is a constant challenge that will frustrate most players. Cause let me tell you, you will be running back and forth like you've never done before. Every path has more branching paths and it never seems to stop. There is one room I had to revisit like 6 or 7 times because I always seem to be missing something. I got so sick of being here. At least we find the well hidden Uzis. Now we finally have all the weapons. Let's walk down these tracks. What? Are you serious? I thought this place was abandoned. Okay, so we can't go that way. What about here? Whew, close call. When it comes to trial and error, look no further than the drill room. Escape from a giant drill, breakable tiles included. Not fun. 
seriously, who built this building? In London of all places. Is this what regular citizens have to endure every morning on their way to work? Citizens of London, you have my sympathies. There is one part that leaves me scratching my head. We find an old penny somewhere. With that penny we have to buy a ticket and a machine. There are four of them but only one works. How fucking random is that? I would never have found this out on my own. Let's get past here. What, you can't just squeeze through there, Laura? Murdering policemen, natives and guards, no problem. But you have to pay for your ticket, man. That's a weird honor system she has. Believe it or not, there's a temple here. Before we get there, we have to get through a maze with a bunch of doors that need to be opened or closed. Really annoying stuff. The temple itself is pretty neat, as long as you don't get impaled by spikes. We need two of Solomon's keys and here I realized I was missing one. It took me an eternity to figure out that I had to get back to the drill to get it. Just one instance where I had to go in that damned red room again. Then there is a part with three timed doors which is slightly annoying but not too bad. It's such a relief when the level is finally over. A cutscene shows Lara falling into some kind of lair. The leader of the green dudes reveals that they took part in an eternal beauty experiment by Sophia Lee. It didn't work. They lost their faces and are now stuck that way as immortals. They will help Lara get to Lee if she can get them embalming fluid from the Natural History Museum. Sure, why not? As you can hear in my voice, all which is not a favorite of mine. It's too complicated for its own good and not too fun. Don't even get me started on the secrets. I really want to like this level because its setting is unique. But I spent more time being angry than having fun. That's not a good sign. Lutz Gate starts in the lair of the green dudes and they are friendly now. I hope they don't find out I slaughtered a bunch of their friends. Right away we have to avoid another spiked ceiling coming down on us. After a long climbing section we get to the Natural History Museum where we kill another guard who's just doing his job. An Egypt themed room serves as a huge puzzle which left me scratching my head at times. It's not a section I enjoy that much but it's a nice callback to the Egypt levels from Tomb Raider 1. At the end we're rewarded with the embalming fluid. We can skip going back to the lair but it's not smart. Not only because of secrets but you don't want to miss this. Back in the lair we place the fluid in an alcove which opens the door to the second half of the level. Spoiler alert. I hate this part. This is basically the dreaded water level. You know how I feel about this aquatic stuff. I didn't really like the water stages in Tomb Raider 2, but at least you could see for the most part. Here it's just so damn dark I can't see shit. We find an underwater propulsion vehicle here. It's not mandatory to use it, but it's fast and can shoot harpoons. This is the reason I play London last, so that I have more harpoons. It's a bitch to aim at crocodiles and divers though. I'm so bad at it that I usually use the harpoon gun instead. Controlling this thing is a nightmare too. It gets stuck on corners all the time and it's infuriating. At least it has lights. Next we get into a rather large area with a guard and a frogman. If the guard sees us an alarm goes off and the door to a secret closes. It's not too hard to stay hidden. I've encountered a terrible glitch here though. If you save in this area and reload the secret will be blocked by an invisible wall. That is some major bullshit. And now ladies and gentlemen let me present my most hated part of the entire trilogy. It's an underwater section with 16 openings. 16. One of them lets you get air, the others have switches, doors or items. As you can guess, it's such a pain in the butt to figure out what to do and to constantly swim back for air. The fun factor is below zero for me. Add annoying enemies to the mix and we have reached the low point of the series so far. I get a migraine just thinking about it. I do like this long passage which leads us to the boiler room. By this point I'm just glad to get out of the water, even if that means dealing with fire and pounding pistons. You do not want to get smashed by those. We have to drive back to my hate zone one more time and then we're off to the machine room. Get past the swinging steel thingies and now we just have to cross the ventilation shaft. A cutscene shows Sophia Lee unwilling to just give Lara the artifact. Lutz Gate is pure torture for me. The other London levels aren't among my favorites by any stretch, but this stage is the main reason I don't want to play this chapter. The water sections are too long and confusing and the first half isn't great either. It's one of my least favorite parts in the entire series and it gives me a sour taste. It took me two entire hours to beat it.
City is the final London level. It's essentially one long boss fight, but our weapons don't work. Miss Lee on the other hand shoots blue energy bolts from her scepter with the artifact. Our goal is to get to the top of the structure while dodging the energy blasts. It's a really interesting concept. At the top we shoot the electrical panel and give the evil gal an unpleasant death. Push a button to turn off the electricity and pick up the Eye of Isis. Wow, we have a decent London level. It's short, yes, but I enjoyed it. More than anything, I'm relieved that we can finally put this chapter behind us. Hey, you're still here! I hope you liked this video so far. If you do, please consider leaving a like and subscribing to my geeky channel. It helps out a lot. Thanks. Now we're off to the final set of levels. A CGI cutscene shows Lara sitting in a helicopter on her way to Antarctica. A storm forces the pilot to land. The ice breaks, Lara jumps out and leaves the poor pilot behind. It's everyone for themselves, I guess. Antarctica looks stunning, especially coming from the dark hellhole called London. No offense to my British friends. I prefer the overall look and feel over the Tibet levels in Tomb Raider 2 and it's even snowing. She learned from her mistakes in the previous game and actually brought long pants this time. We're introduced to a new hazard. The water is ice cold. That's not surprising at all, but there's actually a cold meter that drains quickly when we're in the water. Stay in there for too long and you'll freeze to death. Not ideal. Our first goal is to get inside of the ship. Inside, we kill the whole crew. By this point, I don't question her motifs anymore. I'm numb to that whole topic. I'm just waiting for the next serial killer documentary involving a British adventurer in a big ass mansion. We should have seen it coming. One of the buttons lowers an inflatable boat into the water. Yay, another vehicle. For a change, this one controls pretty well, and I'd say it's the most reliable of the bunch. Plus it saves us from the cold. I forgot how confusing this stage is. It looks friendly, but it isn't. In addition to killer dogs, we have many branching paths that involve a lot of backtracking. We find four valves and the solution is posted on one of the walls nearby. At least that's better than the visions in Area 51. Oh look, a corpse. Maybe it has something for us. Oh my lord, what was that? Some kind of poison spitting zombie mutant? Are there more of them? And why are the doors clamping? Is this place haunted? I guess we'll find out sooner than later. We reach a cabin and trigger a cutscene. Lara meets Dr. Willard. She confronts him about the mutant. Willard talks about experiments and accelerating evolution. With the help of the four artifacts he can now access the power of the meteorite. Lara is not okay with that but he manages to get the goods and escape. She follows him down into the mines. Antarctica is not one of the better stages because it's often not very clear what to do. With the exception of the layout I have no real gripes with it though and it feels like I can breathe again after the claustrophobic London levels. Plus driving the boat is quite fun. Back then, RX Tech Mines was a level I genuinely feared. And that's not because of the stupid puzzle at the very start. It's a square hallway with a bunch of doors that open and close automatically. If we turn around at the right moment, a new passage will be open. It's just trial and error and not very good game design. We see two mutants crawling on the floor. Suddenly a guy with a flamethrower takes care of them. He's friendly unless we shoot him. A wise man once said, don't mess with a guy holding a flamethrower. Well, I said that. Anyway, this level is crawling with slow, venomous zombie things. They are creepy, but as long as we keep our distance, nothing bad should happen. Just remember that they also throw up poison when they die. And because we haven't had enough vehicles so far, yet another one is introduced here. Minecarts. Oh boy. There are three of them which lead us to different areas. We're not told where to go first, so it's just a guessing game. Start with either the lower or middle level carts. I'm taking the middle route. Not much we can do here. We can break and use a wrench to hit switches. Breaking of course is great to avoid tipping over. Being too slow can be bad too as we don't want to fall into gaps. So these are just more frustrating trial and error sections. Hitting the switches can be a bitch too and again there's no way to know 
beforehand if you have to hit it at all. I don't know man, I hate to be so negative, but this just isn't fun, like at all, and it drags on forever. When we finally arrive at our destination, we hear another flamethrower guy roasting a zombie. Good job, random guy. Get past some drills and slide down a slope. We go into a tunnel and holy fuck what the hell is that? It's a goddamn monster, on steroids. This just turned into a legit horror game, jump scares inclusive. The next part looks like a couple of easy jumps, but I messed up over and over and over again. It's not even funny, I spent almost 15 minutes here. Why can't you hold on to that fucking ledge, Lara? These grinders are pretty cool hazards. When I finally made it back to the minecart, I realized that I forgot something. I failed to see the crowbar, which is essential. So I had to do this shit all over again. Check this out, this is the slowest death in history. All because I missed the switch. With the crowbar we can open a door to a room with a lead acid battery in it. On to the lower level. Sometimes we have to duck so Lara doesn't smash her head. Well, I want to smash something over my head because these sections drive me nuts. This next bit is very memorable and I'd say it's the scariest part of the trilogy. First we have to go through some dark corridors. Steam rises from the floor as lights flicker. It's best to take things slow. Son of a bitch! Like I said, a horror game. While crawling below the room we just came from, we can hear another one. This is seriously creeping me out. Did you see that? I'm not a horror game fan, but this is very well done. Later we have to kill two more of them. Don't you think I see you? Amateur. Apparently their brains didn't evolve. With a winch starter in our inventory we return to the cart. The upper level leads us to a pool. We use our items to lower our submersible. Now if I were to do a no meds no saves run, this would be the part that most certainly would break me. We have to make it through the freezing water without dying and with hardly any time. It's just diving from one opening to the next hoping to barely survive. There is no room for error. I like the idea and the setting, but the execution is sadistic. At the end of the level we kill more zombies and enter a Quonset hut. RX Tech Mines is one of the hardest stages, but that doesn't have to be a bad thing. When it comes to atmosphere, most other levels can't compete. The enemies are frightening and keep you on your toes. If only they didn't tarnish it with another stupid gimmick. The minecarts almost ruin the entire experience. It says it only took about 43 minutes to beat it, but in reality it was more like 1 hour and 50 minutes. Thankfully, there are no more vehicles to come. Lost City of Tinnis is the last full level and it's a big one. It starts easy enough searching for switches in a key. We make a ladder appear out of thin air and here we have another riddle with 5 buttons. At first I didn't know which buttons to push but if you look closely you realize that the symbols represent food chains. Like human eats bird eats fish. The broken bridge is still at the beginning of the level and already we get to my most hated part. Giant green wasps come flying at us like assholes. They push us off edges and that noise. It's like someone is drilling into my ear. Worst of all is that they seem to respawn infinitely. At least on PlayStation. On PC there are only 21 of them. Yeah, only my ass. I could choose to ignore them, but there's a goddamn secret in their nest. I must have spent half an hour trying to get that secret and making it back. Why is this game trying to make my life miserable in its second half? I guess I could have skipped it because I got one secret too many in Coastal Village, but that's not how I roll, peeps. At another bridge we encounter two more mutants, but they have evolved even further and can shoot blue energy balls. Since I have saved most of my ammo, now is the time to use the rocket launcher. Hell yeah. We get to the main area with a giant light pillar in the middle. The goal is to find four masks which we get by surviving four trials based on the elements. It reminds me of San Francis Folly with its four doors based on gods. We can do them in any order. I started with earth and here we have to venture through quicksand. Of course a piece of shit wasp is on my tail and I can't defend myself. Pure hate. Getting to the mask is very easy. Once we pick it up, an earthquake collapses the ceiling. After that we have to crouch past swinging burners. Every trial ends in the same hallway that leads us back to the main hub. That wasn't too bad. Next I took the air trial, a giant maze. I still remembered the right path. After that we just have to avoid spiked wooden cylinders. The exit opens before we even pick up the mask. Don't forget to take the mask with you or you won't be able to finish the level. 
So far the trials have been easy and rather unremarkable. What's next? Water. This one's a lot more challenging. As you can imagine, this trial takes place underwater and we have to swim past rotating blades. That is rather difficult as our timing has to be perfect. Plus of course we can't run out of air. I died many times but I blame it on no one but myself. Patience is the name of the game. Again we can leave the area without picking up the mask. Why? The fire trial gave me the most trouble. We have to jump onto pillars but some of them ignite when we stand on them so watch out. At the start there is a pillar we can step on and the camera shows a map. Using a flare will show us which pillars we can step on. It's just too bad this doesn't work anymore once we move away from here. After many unnecessary deaths we get to fire breathing statues and invisible platforms. This also shouldn't be too difficult but I messed up a bit. I was really running out of patience by this point. This mask also can be left behind by accident. That's just bad game design. Now we have all four masks but we're not done yet as we need one more key. This is our chance to blow up more mutants. I'm wasting all my grenades and rockets here and it feels rewarding to finally put them to good use. Get ready for a long puzzle section with switches, swinging burners, hinged ledges and an infinite number of wasps. This is stressing me out. I know that you trigger them by stepping on a specific platform, so it's possible to avoid them altogether. Overall it's another section I don't like because it drags on and on. Finally we get the key in a room with more mutants. I usually don't think combat is the strongest element in Tomb Raider, but I enjoyed this immensely. If only the wasps didn't ruin the fun. Inserting two keys and four masks makes the light pillar vanish and we get a cutscene. With the power of the artifacts Willard raises a meteor and then jumps into a pit. This turns him into this. That is both comic and terrifying. I don't know what to feel. That also counts for the entire level. Lost City of Tinnis has some great elements, specifically the water and fire trials. I also enjoy the mutants, but the rest is either boring or drives me nuts. I'm serious, the wasps are the worst enemies in the game, no questions asked. By this point I can't say I'm having much fun anymore as there were way too many exhausting levels in a row. But now it's time for the final boss. Meteorite Cavern has us fight Spider Willard right at the beginning. Here's what we have to do. Shoot him until he's stunned and pick up one of the artifacts. Repeat this process until you have all four and then you can finish him off. The easiest tactic is to use the Desert Eagle but we have to be quick. Willard can either impale us or kill us with one blast of his energy balls. With the narrow walkway we also have to avoid falling into lava. So while this battle is rather short it requires perfect timing. Victory feels sweet. Now we have to climb out of the cavern. That's a part I enjoy and it gives me a little time time to reflect on all my accomplishments. We emerge outside at night and it's still snowing. Here we encounter a couple more guys with machine guns and flamethrowers. Blast them with everything you've got. Check out how much ammo and medicine I had left again. Litterbug for life. Walk towards the helicopter to trigger the final CGI cutscene. Check out this lovely interaction. That pretty much sums up her entire behavior in this game. She escapes with the helicopter and we get the credits with some lovely images of Lara. Meteorite Cavern is a worthy final level in my opinion. The boss fight isn't as epic as the dragon in Tomb Raider 2 but that one was hard to top. I like the final stretch as well. It's another short level and I welcome that. Overall Antarctica is a decent chapter which is tarnished a bit by minecarts and wasps. It's way more enjoyable than London but can't compete with India, Nevada and South Pacific. The final statistics show that it took 11 and a half hours to complete this game with 60 out of 59 secrets. In reality it was more like 16 and a half hours. In the previous games getting all secrets didn't reward you with anything special. This time we get a bonus level. Let's check it out. All Hallows takes place in London again. All of our weapons are gone and we're left with pistols. On PC we get to keep our inventory. Why all these differences? It doesn't matter anyway because this is a platform heavy level. The beginning involves a lot of climbing and we find the only other weapon of this level, the dual Uzis. At the top we drop down into a cathedral. Wait a minute, didn't we pick up the cathedral key in Tam's Wharf? That key didn't seem to do anything. 
Well, from what I've heard, this was originally supposed to be a bonus level between Tam's Wharf and Aldwych if you collected the key. It makes sense when you look at how the cutscene ends. For some reason, the developers scratched that idea and put All Hallows at the end of the game as a reward for all secrets. That's pretty interesting and it explains why the key even exists. This is one confusing level, I can tell you that. It's not clear what to do, but you can figure it out. This zip line is mean because you die if you hold on to it for too long. Good thing I remembered that. In true London fashion, the cathedral is filled with spikes, fire traps and crushers. At this lock I realized that I was missing a key, so I had to backtrack and look for it. In the water we see a bunch of floating bodies. Disgusting. The only enemies in this level are a guard and his dog. Oh look, a bunch of weapons. Let's pick... Aww. Well, All Hallows is okay for what it is. It's nothing special and not really worth getting all the secrets for. At least it's better than most of the other London levels. Beating the game rewards you with all weapons and infinite ammo, but I think I've had enough for now. Let's breathe for a moment and talk about the music and sound. The audio is excellent on all fronts except the wasps. I like the pistol sounds better than in Tomb Raider 2. In general, the weapons sound very satisfying, especially the Desert Eagle and MP5. The German voice acting is surprisingly good and in some places even better than the original. Lara is cast perfectly. This game feels a lot closer to life because we hear birds and other animals in India for example, which enhances the atmosphere tremendously. The music is once again composed by Nathan McCree and what can I say, he did it again. The soundtrack feels very different from previous games, but it still manages to feel like Tomb Raider. It does not sound as mysterious as TR1 or as menacing as TR2, but goes into a different direction. It sounds more adventurous and light-hearted for the most part. Sure, there are some darker ambient tracks which I love, like the echoes in the temples. Overall, I think the first two games have more songs that stand out and give you an adrenaline rush. Nonetheless, I feel three soundtrack is on the same level quality-wise, it's just different and maybe even more fleshed out. So let's honor my favorites. Here are my top 5 songs from Tomb Raider 3. Number 5 I like how this track builds up and crescendos, has a quiet moment in the middle and then builds back up again. Fits really well to a kayak adventure. Number 4. This one is very similar but has a much stronger and immediate sense of danger. Number 3. Like we've come to expect, the theme song is very beautiful. It sounds familiar yet different. I like that it's varied and more complex than in previous entries. It might be my favorite Tomb Raider theme of them all. Number 2. This track has elements from the theme song, but is another beast entirely. It gives me the feeling that I'm on an adventure around the globe and I get goosebumps when I hear it in Nevada desert. Number 1. As we get deeper into the jungle, this wonderful piece of music starts playing. It's mysterious and sounds unlike anything we've heard so far. It puts me back to the late 90s when I played this game for the first time and fell in love with it. It's time to wrap things up. Summing up this experience will be a lot more difficult than I ever expected. 
Before this playthrough, I was 100% certain that this is my favorite Tomb Raider game of all time. And in many ways, it still is. On the PS1, I think it's one of the best looking games. It's a clear improvement over the second game with dynamic lighting, weather effects and overall more beautiful and varied environments. The presentation is top notch and the music elevates the experience even further. We don't get as many CGI cutscenes as in the second game, but the in-game clips work well too. This game has the best arsenal of weapons in the entire series in my opinion, and the new moves serve as great additions as well. The enemy variety is a huge improvement over the previous game too, with less focus on humans. The entire look and feel of it, including the menu, is unmatched to this day. This is peak Tomb Raider for me. The tutorial managed to top the excellent training levels that came before. I can't emphasize enough how much I love that you can choose the order of the chapters you play. That's a sense of freedom I wasn't expecting at the time. I also like that we have more boss fights in this game. I just wish we had one in Area 51 too, like an alien or something. While I think Natla and Marco Bartoli are better villains than Willard, I love the quest that he sends us out to. With Lara traveling across the globe, I feel like we're playing a James Bond movie. And if there's anything I love more than video games, it's James Bond movies. Seriously, it's the best thing I know. Each chapter feels unique and most of them are excellent. I just can't wrap my head around how great the beginning is. If you play it in the order I did, I'd say we have the best stretch of levels of the franchise. If you take away the quad, kayak and labyrinth, they're all very strong and dare I say almost perfect. Temple Ruins and Crash Site are the absolute highlights for me. Back in the day, most of my time with this game was spent in India, Nevada and the South Pacific. I could just replay these levels endlessly, except Madabu Gorge. But then unfortunately comes London. It baffles my mind how much I dislike these levels. It's like I'm playing a completely different game. They're too dark and confusing. I honestly feel like shutting the game off when I get there. And that's what I usually did back then. Antarctica is much better, but has some infuriating moments too. By this point I'm kind of over it and feel like I'm forcing myself to beat it, even though I like the creepy atmosphere of RX Tech Mines. My biggest problem with this game is the many vehicles. Let's count them. Two quad bikes, kayak, underwater propulsion vehicle, inflatable boat and minecart. That's five different types of vehicles and only one of them controls really great, the inflatable boat. The quad bike is okay too for the most part, but the rest are terrible, I'm sorry. They are guaranteed to give me a bad time thanks to awful controls and my lack of skill and patience. I don't like that you don't see an icon of the item you picked up anymore. Why did they remove it? The levels in general are a lot more open than in previous entries with many branching paths. That can make navigating and finding your goal a real nightmare. I can only speak for myself, but in most levels I don't see that as a problem and actually have fun exploring them. The exception is London and to a certain extent some Antarctica levels. The game is a lot more difficult than its predecessors and sometimes it relies too much on trial and error. For 23 years I've been holding this game in the highest regard possible, but I have to be honest with myself. It can't be my favorite Tomb Raider game when I despise an entire chapter. It feels like I'm kicking my childhood in the face with this statement, but it's true. If this game was just India, Nevada and South Pacific, it might even be my favorite game of all time. I love these levels that much. But with London sucking the fun out of the experience, I feel annoyed by the time I get to Antarctica. So how do I rank this game? This could change at any time, but for now I'm putting it between Tomb Raider 1 and 2. It has the highest highs and the lowest lows. So yeah, newcomers might want to start with the earlier titles first, because this is for more advanced raiders. I'd recommend the PC version over this one, because it's a little more user friendly and it looks better too. Two years after this game came out, Core Design released an add-on called The Lost Artifact as a PC exclusive. Don't get me wrong, I still love this game and consider consider it one of my favorite titles of all time. It has a very special place in my heart and I will never forget the excitement I felt when I could finally play the first game I bought with my own money. It makes me sad that I will probably never feel this way about a game 
ever again. But hey, this was the first time I did watch my dad play the game, and it was the other way around. He watches me play games to this day when I visit him, and this is where it all started. Nostalgia plays a huge part in my love for this entry, but that doesn't change the fact that when this game is at its best, it's as perfect as it can get. Hey everyone, this is G from. Thank you so much for watching this long ass episode. I hope it won't take another 11 years before I review Tomb Raider 4. Feel free to rate, comment, and subscribe. I'll see you later. Have a nice day.